I want to talk to you this morning, and actually for the next several weeks, on a topic that most of us find very difficult to talk about. In social settings, we don't like to tell people, we believe in hell, and there's a good chance you're going there. <laughs> it's kind of awkward. And unfortunately, hell is gaining ground. Because more people that don't believe in it means more people are not worried about avoiding it and therefore are more inclined to go there. Heck, if I was the prince of hell, I'd want everybody not to believe in it so nobody has to worry about going there. And then when they show up, I could poke them with my pitchfork and laugh at them. And that's exactly what's happening, sans the pitchfork. People today not just secularists, not just pagans, but pastors and theologians, well-known pastors and theologians, are starting to critique the concept of hell. They're, they're rejecting it. They're saying it's not a biblical concept. In a sense, we could say, Phil, hell is under fire today. All right. Just think on it for a minute. Let's take a look at this video here, if we can kill the stage lights too. Thanks. One megachurch pastor has ignited a theological firestorm by suggesting that our response to the Christian message in this life will not necessarily determine our eternal destiny. In his book, Love Wins, Heaven, Hell and the Fate of Every Person Who Ever Lived, Rob Bell says that ultimately all people will be saved, when though, even those who've rejected the claims of Christianity. He argues people will eventually be persuaded by God's love post-mortem in the life to come. And Pastor Rob Bell joins us now. Good afternoon, sir. Before Good we come you. to talk about the book, just help us with this tragedy in Japan. Which of yeah. these is true? Either God is all-powerful, but he doesn't care about the people of Japan and therefore they're suffering, or he does care about the people of Japan, but he's not all-powerful. Which one is it? I begin with the belief that God, when we shed a tear, God sheds a tear. So, so I, I begin with a divine being who is profoundly empathetic, compassionate, and stands in solidarity with us. Secondly, the dominant story of the scriptures is about restoration, it's about renewal, it's about rebirth, it's about a God who insists in the midst of this chaos, the last word hasn't been spoken. And so people of faith have clung to this promise and this hope that God will essentially fix this place. And it's a beautiful hope, and I think we ought to keep it front and center, especially right now. So which of those is true? He's all-powerful and he cares, or he cares and is not all-powerful? I think that this is a paradox at the heart of the divine, and some paradoxes are best left exactly as they are. Okay. This book you've written has been stirring some controversy because the implication is, as you put it, God's love will eventually melt hearts. That's what you say in the book. So are you a universalist who believes that everyone can go to heaven regardless of how they respond to Christ on earth? Um, in, in regards to the question, are you a universalist, I would say first and foremost, no. And that is a perspective within the Christian stream. There has been, within the Christian tradition, a number of people who have said, given enough time, God will win everybody over. Um, one of the things in the book I'm very clear on and, and want people to see is that this tradition has all of these different opinions. Everybody will be won over. Some will continue to resist God's love. And that Christians have disagreed about this speculation. I, I, I get that. And but so, so so is it irrelevant and is it immaterial about how one responds to Christ in this life in terms of determining one's eternal destiny? Is that immaterial? I think it's extraordinarily important. I think it's extraordinarily important. in your important. book you said that God wins regardless in the end. Um, love wins for me is a way of understanding that God is love and love demands freedom. You are asking for it both ways. That doesn't make sense. I'm asking you. Is it irrelevant as to how you respond to Christ in your life now to determine your eternal destiny? Is that irrelevant? Is it immaterial? It is terribly relevant and terribly important. Now, how exactly that works out and how exactly it works out in the future, we are now, when you die, firmly in the realm of speculation. 
and my experience has been that a lot of Christians have built whole dogmas about what happens when you die and we have to be very careful that we don't build whole doctrines and dogmas on what is speculation. Uh, Jesus, I, I'm, I'm not talking about okay. what happens when you die, I'm asking you how you respond here and now. And the question I'm asking you and what yes. you seem to be saying in this book yep. is that God will love, will melt everyone's heart eventually, some even post-mortem in death. So you're the one making the speculation about the afterlife. What I'm asking is, is it irrelevant and immaterial about how you respond to Christ now to determine your eternal destiny? Is that relevant or irrelevant? Does it have a bearing or does it have no bearing? I, has, I think it has tremendous bearing. It also at the same time raises all sorts of questions and that is why the discussion is so lively and vibrant. Namely, what about people who haven't heard about Jesus? What about uh, the woman I talked to a couple weeks ago who was abused by her pastor? And so for her, Jesus is tied up in all sorts of things and I assume that God's grace gives people space to work those sort of issues one, out. One critique of your book says this, there are dozens of problems with Love Wins. The history is inaccurate, the use of scripture indefensible. That's true, isn't it? No, it's not true. So why do you choose, for example, to accept and promote the works of the early writer Origen and not, for example, Arius, who took a view of Jesus' deity as, as in being not, de not God. Why do you select one and not select the other? Because first and foremost, I'm a pastor. And so I deal with real people in a real world asking and wrestling with these issues of faith. And what I have discovered over and over again is there are people who have questions and hunches and have sort of, I'm really struggling with this. And when you can simply give them the gift of, by the way, within the Christian tradition, there are scholars and theologians and there are other people who have had the same questions. But they have had the, the same But you, you've just indicated, though, one of the problems with this book, which is, in a sense, you're creating a Christian message that's warm, kind, and popular for contemporary culture, but it's frankly, according to this critic, unbiblical and historically unreliable. That's true, isn't it? No. What it's you've not done true. is you're amending the gospel, the Christian message, so that it's palatable to contemporary people who find, for example, the idea of hell and heaven very difficult to stomach. So here comes Rob Bell. He's made a Christian <laughs> gospel for you, and it's perfectly palatable. It's much easier to swallow. That's what you've done, isn't you? No, I haven't. And there's actually an entire chapter in the book on hell. And there's an, I mean, throughout the book, over and over again, our choices matter. The decisions we make about whether we extend love to others or not, the ways in which we resist or we open ourselves to God's love, these are incredibly important. How much, how much is this book, you working out your own childhood experience of being brought up in a fairly cramped evangelical family and really finding that difficult as you became an adult, how much is this actually that? Oh, I would totally own up to that in a heartbeat. I think we are all on a journey and we're all, we all were handed things. You were handed things, I were handed things. This is the way the world works. This is what matters, this is what doesn't. Here's who these people are, here's who these people are. Here's who's in, here's who's out. We've all been handed these things and we spend our lives sort of pushing back and questioning and probing. I think that's what makes it so engaging. It's part of the joy of life. Pastor Rob Bell, thank you very much for joining us. And your book is called Love Wins, a book about heaven, hell, and the fate of every person who ever lived. Thank you. Wow, right? Did you come away from that very thorough interview totally understanding Rob Bell's position? Because even somebody who wrote a book and is extremely famous has a hard time talking about hell. It's awkward, it's uncomfortable especially when you were kind of, now you're the wishy-washy guy. You're presenting the new picture, renew picture. You don't like the idea that people die, go to hell forever, so I'm gonna come up with a new theology that as Martin Bashir said, it's more comfortable, it's more palatable. You know, the idea that hell isn't real or not literal or not eternal is a comforting concept. It's very similar to you going to the doctor and him telling you, your cancer's all gone, you're, you're fine. Feels great, unless it's not true. Then that comfort is short-lived and the consequences are evil. As we talked about last week, what is truth, it really doesn't matter what our opinion is. The question is, is hell real? Is it literal? And will people go there and suffer forever? That's what we have to answer. 
not whether we're comfortable with it or not, not whether it's awkward to talk about publicly or not. Nobody likes the idea of hell. We don't want people to go there. We don't want to go there. But if it's true, if it's real, the greatest disservice we can do to people is tell them it's not true and it's not real. And the greatest service we can do is tell them how to keep from going there. There's a couple of problems with the hell conversation, and it almost always comes down to how Martin Bashir started his interview. Which one of these is true? God is either all-powerful and doesn't care, yada, 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 false dilemma. But it comes down to this. Why would a loving God send people to to hell forever? How could a loving God do that? And so the conversation about hell has nothing to do with the theology of hell. It has everything to do with the theology of love. But in order to understand the theology of hell, hell, you have to understand at least seven other things, at least. There's more, but these will get you started. You have to understand biblical hermeneutics. That is the proper way of interpreting scripture and understanding it. If you don't understand how to study the Bible, you can't know what the Bible says about heaven and hell or God's love even. So before we can talk about hell, we've got to start at the very basics. Do we properly know how to understand the Bible? Biblical hermeneutics. Now, that's an entire seminary course. And that course could be just an introduction to it. You also have to understand something about God's holiness. You can't talk about hell without understanding holiness. And you'll understand that in the coming weeks. We can't properly understand the doctrine of hell unless we properly understand the doctrine of God's justice. We can't properly understand the doctrine of hell unless we properly, emphasizing the word properly, understand the doctrine of God's vengeance. We can't say we understand hell until we say we understand God's wrath. We can't say whether or not people go to hell forever until we understand the nature of the human soul. Does it even last forever? Without answering the one, we can't answer the other. And then finally, we can talk about God's love. One-seventh of the topics is the one people want to talk about, the one that's furthest from the topic. And then they rest on that. So today we're going to look at biblical hermeneutics. Then we'll look at God's holiness. Then we'll look at God's justice, vengeance, and wrath. And then we'll work our way into a lesson of hell. Not all today. Today's just the hermeneutics. And I'm barely going to touch it just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. And then we're going to jump into these other topics. Why? Because I want you to have a starting point for your own studies. I don't think after these several sermons you're going to be fully and completely equipped. But hopefully, oh, yeah, there are other things to consider, and then you can study those out. So biblical hermeneutics deals with what do the texts actually say? What are they trying to communicate? What does the Bible say, and then what does it mean by what it says? Are there any literary devices at play? Is this maybe a metaphor, symbolism? Is it poetry? And if so, is the poetry intending to make a literal point. These are questions we have to ask about all these hell passages. Those who reject a literal eternal hell usually do so simply on point number seven, God's love. But what about hermeneutics? What does the Bible specifically say about love? Now, I don't want to play down God's love. That's the greatest doctrine in the Bible. But it's not the only doctrine in the Bible. John 3.16 is only one verse out of a thousand plus pages. There's so much more in there. I believe God is love, but I also believe that God is holy and just. I also believe that God said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, to quote a passage of scripture. I believe it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, says another passage of scripture. I believe that the human soul that rejects God lasts forever. So where does it go if not heaven? 
See, there's so much more to talk about. Ah, but Steve, believing in an eternal hell, it's incompatible with the love of God. Well, if we were to reject out of hand the concept of hell saying it's incompatible with the love of God, what would we do with the flood of Noah? We'd have to reject that out of hand too. What about the plagues on the Egyptians? Chuck them. What about, and this is uncomfortable, but if God's love removes the possibility of hell, wouldn't it also remove the possibility of children suffering today, right now? And yet children do suffer today, right now, and Rob Bell and others still believe God is love. So they're being logically inconsistent, saying that hell is not compatible with God's love when the suffering that's going on in the planet today is compatible with God's love. Martin Bashir started the interview with that. Which one of these is true? Well, like I said, it was a false start, a false dilemma. He didn't have either of them just right. But it is a question people wrestle with. And the hell people, the people who want to reject hell, pleading for God's love, have to deal with this too. Because the very same God who they say would never allow anybody to go to hell is the very same God that allows people to suffer today. So why wouldn't we suffer in the afterlife if we're suffering in this life? Do I like the idea? Nope. But I'm not going to just check it out. You know, the Bible talks about love. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that doctrine. The Bible talks about hell. I don't like that doctrine. I'm not going to keep it. So then the Bible becomes a smorgasbord of truth options. And we get to choose the ones we like. That's not good either. Some say that hell is incompatible with God's love. But is it incompatible with his holiness? Is it incompatible with justice and vengeance? Is it incompatible with his wrath? Is it incompatible with the nature of the human soul lasting forever? So of these seven topics, they say it's incompatible with one-seventh, but it's compatible with six-sevenths. Do some math. Six-sevenths is more than one-seventh. All right, hermeneutics, my favorite rule, called the golden rule of hermeneutics. When the plain sense makes sense, look for no other sense or you'll end up with nonsense. That's the primary rule in studying the Bible. It means what it says. That's it, it means what it says. When the plain sense makes sense, look for no other sense or you'll end up with nonsense. When the plain sense makes sense. That accommodates literary device, poetry, metaphor, and symbolism, because that's not plain sense. Jesus said, I am the door. He didn't mean he was hinged and made out of wood. So you can understand he's using a metaphor there. But when the Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery, it means exactly what it says. When the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that's exactly what it means. When it says he spoke and they were created, that's what it means. The whole Bible means what it says. When the plain sense makes sense, look for no other sense, or you'll end up with nonsense. I'm hoping I said it enough times that you can memorize it and it become your golden rule of study as well. The Bible is literature. It can be understood. It was written so that it might be understood. The Bible means what it says. Unless there's some blatant literary apparent device at play, some sort of metaphor or symbolism. But even when there's metaphor or symbolism or even poetry, we still have to ask ourselves, what's the poet trying to communicate? All right, so having made the point that the Bible means what it says and says what it means. In just a couple moments, we'll look at some hell verses and see if the plain sense makes sense. But before I go into those, something jumped into my mind while I was studying, and I just found it fascinating. I thought I'd share it with you. You know, tell me if you've heard this before. The God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath, but the God of the New Testament is a God of grace and mercy. If you've ever heard that before, let me see your hands. Yeah, a lot of people have heard that. Oh, Jesus is so nice. Why, why didn't he show up in the Old Testament? Like God totally changed his character between Malachi and Matthew. 
But here's a challenge for you. Go home, try to find the doctrine of hell in the Old Testament, and then try to find it in the New Testament. It's all over the New Testament. Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. Interesting, isn't it? But it's very hard to find in the Old Testament. I'm not saying it's not there, it is, but it's hard to find. So supposedly the Old Testament is all about God's wrath, but it's hard to find hell in there. And the New Testament's all about God's grace, but you find hell all over the place in there. Interesting. Just to clarify, hell, the way I'm using it, refers to an eternal state of suffering apart from God. One of the problems with this discussion about hell, especially with those who study the Bible seriously, is that we use that word hell, and it refers to many Greek and Hebrew words and concepts, and that's confusing. And so let's not focus in on the word hell. Let's just focus in on the concept of suffering in the afterlife forever, and use whatever word you want. For example... Daniel chapter 12 does not use the word hell once, but tell me if you can come up with some other meaning for it. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, and others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavenly expanse, and those who turn many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. But what's the plain meaning of this passage? The plain meaning is people will rise from the dead. They will die. They'll rise to judgment. Some will be sent off to everlasting punishment. Some will be sent off to everlasting life. That's what it means. That's what it says. Everlasting shame and contempt versus everlasting life. Well, it's everlasting shame. It doesn't end. They're not annihilated. It's not forgotten. It goes on forever. Ah, but Steve, hell can't be forever. Well, then neither can everlasting life because it's in the same verse and it's the same Hebrew word for each. Whatever stands true for everlasting shame and its everlastingness also stands for life and its everlastingness. And it's the same in the New Testament when you see these words about everlasting life or everlasting punishment, same Greek words. So if we say that the afterlife for punishment is not eternal, we have to also say that the afterlife for salvation is not eternal either. People who go to hell, they're not there forever. People who go to heaven, they're not there forever either. But nobody does that. But you have to. It's only consistent. Two possible, possible destinies. Everlasting shame and contempt or everlasting life. Yeshua, Jesus, he taught the exact same thing. Probably had this passage in mind. Let me just give you one verse of something he said. Then... They will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Not a metaphor, no literary device, just plain Greek, plain English. Like I said about the Hebrew word, the Greek word, the Hebrew word was olam, by the way, and the Greek word here is ionios, which means forever. Same word For eternal punishment, same word for eternal life. That word eternal, ionios, no difference. A couple more verses. Luke 12. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who will kill the body and after that can do no more. But I'll show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after killing of the body has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. See, Jesus wasn't mincing words. He knew that fear is one of the things that keeps us from obeying God. So Jesus said, well, let me explain to you who you should really fear. That guy, he can kill you. That's all he can do to you. But God can throw you into hell forever. Now, who do you want to fear? So don't fear the the guy who's trying to make you sin from peer pressure or threat of harm, even martyrdom, make you deny God because he, he will kill you. Hey, you're going to die anyway. But afterwards, I'll tell you who to fear. It it can't possibly mean anything else. When the plain sense makes sense, look for no other sense. Or you end up with nonsense. And the fact that Jesus is saying, you have something to fear about the afterlife, 
makes those who are fudging on the topic irrelevant, in my opinion. I don't need to read their books. I've read the book. I know Jesus' opinion on it. I don't need Rob Bell's opinion on it. Jude 1.7. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Now, how in the world do they serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire? Well, if you don't know the story, God judged them by raining fire and brimstone on them. That's an example of those who will suffer what? Eternal fire. What you saw happen to Sodom and Gomorrah, that's an example of what's happening to people in the afterlife. I don't like that. And you know what that means? I am spiritually immature and I've got a spiritual problem because apparently God's okay with it. And if God's okay with it and I'm not okay with it, one of us has got a problem and we know which one it is. So there's something within my spiritual well-being that is not as mature as it needs to be. And over the coming weeks, I think we're going to learn that my grasp of God's holiness is insufficient. My sense of justice is insufficient. Because if I really grasped the concept of God's holiness, and I really grasped God's sense of justice, I'd be right there with him. I wouldn't say hell seems unfair to me. I recognize I've got a ways to go. I'm on that journey. The Bible teaches that everyone who sins will go to hell. And then the Bible teaches everyone sins. But the Bible also teaches everyone needs a savior and Jesus is that savior. Let me ask you a question. It's rhetorical. You can go home and chew on it. I'm not asking for an answer. If there's no hell, what did he save us from? In my opinion, if there's no hell, there's no savior. <laughs> just, I told you before, if God's love wipes out the, the possibility of hell, it has to wipe out the flood of Noah, it has to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. Heck, it has to wipe out the whole Bible now. Just remove Jesus from the whole picture. We don't need you anymore. Thank you. Rob Bell has saved us. By the way, I like Rob Bell. He's done a lot of good things, continues to do a lot of good things. According to the text, if hell isn't everlasting, then heaven isn't everlasting either. Just a summary of some of my thoughts written down on paper. So, to wrap it all up, to understand the doctrine of hell, we have to understand at least seven other doctrines, and I limited my list. The doctrine of biblical hermeneutics, how to properly understand the Bible. The doctrine of God's holiness, which is next week's lesson. The doctrine of God's justice, God's vengeance, and God's wrath. Those are three related but separate doctrines. But they are related, and I have not yet decided if each one's getting its own sermon or not. I'm only a couple weeks ahead. I've not gotten there yet. So this may be a seven-part series. It may be a four-part series, a five-part series. We'll see. God's justice, vengeance, and wrath. Sixth, the nature of the human soul. And seventh, finally, the last lesson in the series. We will talk about God's love because it's only necessary, just, and right that we do so. Well, here I've talked to you for the better part of half an hour. Still have not touched biblical hermeneutics other than to tell you the plain, when the plain sense makes sense, looks for no other sense, so you end up with nonsense. And then I read to you a few Bible passages about hell. You can go home and read books on her, biblical hermeneutics, and I would encourage you to do so. There's nothing greater for Bible study than learning how to study the Bible. Before I finish up, though, I want to switch gears. I don't want to end having discussed only hell. The word heaven, like the word hell, is used in various ways in conversation, and therefore it causes some confusion. 
So I want to talk to you about the positive side of the afterlife, but maybe not necessarily use the word heaven. When I read to you that Daniel passage, it didn't use the word hell. There's all sorts of passages that talk about the afterlife that don't use the word heaven either. In fact, in Judaism, um, Jewish people don't talk about going to heaven. They talk about the olam haba. That's the world to come. They talk about Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. They talk about the Messianic era, what we might call the kingdom. But heaven, even though Judaism believes in heaven, it's not the concept that they attribute to the afterlife. It's life here on earth, which is a true concept. Conversation for another day. God loves us. God does not want anyone to go to hell. God has done and is doing everything he can to keep that from happening. And we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. But I told you I wanted to read a passage or two about the afterlife. So here's the one everybody knows with a little context tied to it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Doesn't say anything about heaven there. Just says if we believe in Jesus, we're good to go. But there is a context. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe in him stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the son will not see life for God's wrath remains on him. People say, how can you believe a loving God sends people to hell? And I often will say, I don't think God sends anybody to hell. God's doing everything within his power to keep you from going to hell. But if you really want to go, if you insist, he'll let you go. That's more how I see it. And he'll do so with a tear in his eye and the memory of his crucified son standing right before him. No, God doesn't send people to hell in the sense of it's some arbitrary a malicious act on his part. He just can't wait to send you there. No, he's doing everything to keep you from going there. But humans have free will. And the story is sort of like this. Let's say you're a loving father and you have a child that goes astray and your child gets into drugs and totally destroys their life. They they rob to feed their habit their, their body is being eaten up from the inside. Nobody likes them. Nobody trusts them because they're not likable or trustworthy. They just live for the drug. So what do you do? You go up to the father and you hate him and say, why don't you do something? Well, what can the father possibly do? Well, the father could kidnap him, chain him to a sofa, and give him just enough room to get to the shower and the bathroom and the kitchen and keep him there for the rest of his life and I'll never take drugs again. Yet nobody does that. But we could. Because then you'd have a chained drug addict wanting to get out of the chain to get more drugs. You wouldn't have a whole person. You'd have half a person chained doing what you want him to do because you're forcing him to do it. Just like we would never do that, God will never do that. He's the loving father. We're the sinners We have gone astray, and he wants us to give up the habit. And the habit here is sin. Sin is a drug. We love it. But it's killing us. It's destroying us from the inside, and it gives us no future and no hope. I've got more to say on this in the coming weeks. Would you please join me in prayer? Lord, I know it's a hard topic for all of us, I pray you would give us the wisdom to address it properly with our friends and those you bring across our paths who need to hear it. And I say to address it properly, not to avoid it, not to be gun shy, to be bold and sensitive 
instead of shy and sensitive. Help us to be truthful, to remember in the moment that we're not doing anybody any good by taking the fear of hell out of their lives. I pray for myself, Lord, and for everybody else who hears me. And I pray that the fear of hell would be replaced by the love of Yeshua. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.